Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Transforming the Transportation Industry with Cooperative Automation Research Mobility Applications or CARMA for short. My name is Nilo Parvinashtiani and I will help facilitate today's webinar. Um, so a few words about the webinar host, the National Operations Center of Excellence or NOCO. Uh, here at NOCO we support the transportation systems management and operations community. So on the bottom left side of your screen, you, you can see a few ways that you can connect to us by subscribing to our newsletter, Twitter, YouTube channel, or just browsing to our website. Also in there, uh, a few <coughs> links related to our webinar today is shared with you. And on the right side of that, and you can see today's slides in PDF format, so you can directly download them from there. Um, so let me cover a few logistics before we start off uh, today's webinar. We are recording this webinar, and the recording, along with the presentation slide, uh, will be shared with you through the NOCO website. All the attendee phones are, listen, are on the listen-only mode by default, uh, but we'd like you to stay engaged by using the, the question discussion pod that uh, I have here on the screen. So during the presentation, any time that a question comes to your mind, feel free to put that in the question discussion pod. Um, at the end, uh, we will have the a question and answer session, and all of your questions will be read out loud one at a time, and our presenters will answer each question. So with that, I'll hand it over to Laura Daly, uh, who will help start us off with the webinar. Good morning, and we're very excited to kick off our Carmel webinar series. Today, we're going to introduce Taylor Lecrane, and he's going to walk you through the Karma platform, and then John Stark will be going through the technical components. Following that, we will have a question and answer session. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Taylor Locker, and I'm with Federal Highway Administration. I'm the technical manager for the Cooperative Automation Research Program here at uh, Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center located in McLean. Uh, it's a very exciting day for us, and we really appreciate you all setting the time up in your busy schedules to, you know, kind of learn about karma and see, you know, how we can start to engage uh, you all uh, in this research effort focused on cooperative automation. So Federal Highway Administration over the past, you know, uh, you know five to ten years has really focused on trying to understand the opportunities that automation and connectivity uh, can provide for uh, safe and efficient movement of goods and services in our country. And we've been focusing a little bit areas on arterials and freeways. Uh, you know, those are some major components within Federal Highway. And so what are areas in which this technology can really support, you know, fuel efficiency and increased throughput and maximizing the capacity of the highways as highways start to get more congested? How can we put more cars on the road? So we've done a lot of research with trucks, looking at truck platooning, and we see a huge benefit in fuel savings, but also in the passenger vehicle side, we start to see a lot of improvements when it comes to vehicle platooning as an opportunity for vehicles to, uh, you know, follow closer, safer, uh, and we can increase the capacity. And therefore, maybe one day we don't need to have so much expenses in expanding highways, just operating them more efficiently as this technology starts to increase. One of our main ingredients in this research program is really focused around connectivity. And we're really trying to understand how do we manage our transportation system if connectivity is available and we have all this technology within automated driving systems coming forward. So we're really trying to look at the uh, concept of what is a cooperative automated driving system and what are the opportunities it could provide for mobility and then how do we improve our transportation systems management and operations, which we call TISMO, how do we improve our TISMO strategies to take advantage of the capabilities of this technology? So as you can see in this picture on the slide, you know, today we have a lot of expensive infrastructure such as gantries to help manage uh, speed in the lane. Uh, you might see this in Seattle and a couple other uh, locations across the country here in the U.S., heavily used over in the European countries. But what about if we didn't have to install that hardware, we could start to send this information wirelessly uh, to the vehicles 
uh, and we can start to use that in a very tactical way. And so that's kind of what we're focusing on when it comes to cooperative automation and how we're improving TISMO. So the TISMO strategy, for those that aren't familiar, these are the strategies that the, trans the state DOTs, uh, you know, focus on trying to operate the system uh, more efficiently. So focus on work zone management, traffic incident management, special events when you're leaving a football game or any sort of major event in a city, how do you manage that exodus of, of uh, people from a, a certain location, uh, you know, from freight management, movement of trucks, uh, from ports uh, through, through cities to their, to their distribution warehouses, uh, even ramp management, how, we, how we're going to, uh, you know, uh, manage how many vehicles enter the freeway. Uh, and then there's a lot of other uh, opportunities with congestion pricing and access management um, that the TISMO program kind of oversees. So it's a very large program and there's a lot going on. So how do we start to see this program evolving with technology? And that's kind of one of the big questions that we're trying to address with Karma. So we've developed this new platform called Karma as a way to help us advance these research questions into reality. So we can start to take these ideas and start to see the effects it might have on mobility. And so this all started back in 2014, and I'm going to kind of walk through the evolution of this platform, what we've learned and where we're going. So back in 2013, one of the main research questions we had was really focused on, can a vehicle send a message to another vehicle, and can that vehicle use that message to um, apply a specific uh, function, such as following closely? Uh, this was a, really based on cooperative adaptive cruise control where all the vehicles are broadcasting a mobility message and each of the vehicles receive the messages and kind of understand where the other vehicles are and use that information to follow closer. And we start to see big improvements with this technology, uh, you know, for the mobility side of things. And this is a level one technology. So it's just adding a connectivity layer to your adaptive cruise control. And then the vehicle dynamics enhances the capability, which we start to see some benefits in safety and mobility. And so in this system, we really built it, we had to build it, you know, we're the first kind of to do this. This was kind of before the big AV bubble burst where everyone uh, is really, uh, you know, racing to the moon here, you know. And so there wasn't a lot of technology available to create this. And so we had to take a lot of pieces of hardware and, and invent this capability to, and to study and evaluate it. And what we learned from that is when we were done, our question was, well, how do we share this with our partners? How do we engage our partners to help us learn and, and enhance this research moving forward? And so this, this system was built on a MATLAB micro, uh, MATLAB Simulink environment using a DSpace micro auto box to integrate with the vehicle. And we felt like that might not have been the right approach. Um, and so what we awarded in the next phase was Karma 2, and we tried to take a different angle where we said, let's turn to the open source community and let's start to use open source tools to, en to enable us to enhance this capability. So we migrated our capabilities that we developed in the cooperative adaptive cruise control world into a ROS environment. And with that, we tried to take all of the algorithms that we've been researching in micro simulation and through um, some of the different tools that we have at Federal Highway and through a lot of the different research projects that we had. And we said, well, let's create this system to enhance and help us evaluate all these different things we are looking at and then, how, and then try to understand how they all work together. And so that's where we created what's called the integrated highway prototype, which we demonstrated on public roads in June. So what is the integrated highway prototype? Well, it was where we merged our, our capability of, of applying speed harmonization, vehicle platooning, cooperative lane change, cooperative ramp merge um, into one application. Uh, and we, we didn't have a signal on the highway, of course, but we also focused a little bit on when you get off the freeway, you go through a traffic signal, how is that going to work? So we've developed these five plugins. We've done consecutive days of testing at Aberdeen Proving Grounds to develop the capability. And what we were really focused on with the mathematics on this was, you know, speed harmonization, that was an example of how we looked at cloud commanded speed control. So the infrastructures providing information to a vehicle about what speed to go in order to reduce the impact of bottlenecks downstream. And so that capability was very, very, um, uh, studied very much in micro simulation and we were able to integrate it into the vehicle and test it on public roads uh, this past June. Vehicle platooning gave us the opportunity to look at leader follower. So not only 
is the leader of broadcasting information about its trajectory, its speed, its acceleration requirements, but it's actually communicating that with followers, and those followers are, are, are negotiating uh, the behaviors that they operate in. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that this afternoon uh, in, in John's presentation. And then we looked at cooperative lane change, which is more of a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle negotiation, as well as cooperative ramp merge, is where we start to integrate with the infrastructure. So how, how do we start to see this negotiation play out, these shared maneuvers amongst other vehicles and roadway infrastructure? We're able to test those within this platform. And also focusing on approaching and departing multi-signalized intersections. How are we going to use SPAT and MAP messages to effectively go through a traffic signal uh, in an urban environment? And so the platform that we released, we developed as an open source software with the focus to engage industry on cooperative automation. And this is the platform that we released in October that we are going to go over today about how we develop this capability to negotiate amongst other entities. And this enables us to start to really dive into cooperative automation. So one of the most exciting things to talk about today is where we're going next. And where we're going next is more of a multimodal approach. We partnered with our, our friends at Federal Motor Carrier Administration, as well as the Joint Program Office and the Volpe National Transportation Center to combine our resources and really focus on cooperative automation and where, that, where we really see the benefits of this technology across the department. And so one of the approaches that we're taking was we built this capability of, of cooperative automation within the Karma platform to give us the, the opportunities to, to, to do shared maneuvers and negotiations. But what it really needs is it really needs an ADS platform. Karma is not an ADS platform. Karma enables cooperation, but it, it requires us moving forward that it, that it sit on top of an ADS platform to have that functionality. And so we've made the decision um, to migrate Karma with a platform called AutoWare. And we found AutoWare by reaching out to our open source community and determining that this was an open source product that was heavily uh, invested by researchers across the world to develop this ADS capability to enhance the understanding and opportunities of ADS. And so we are in the process of migrating Karma to AutoWare to enhance those capabilities. And so the Karma platform, now we're taking a little bit of a different approach here based on what we learned in Karma 2. We are now applying pure agile software development in our processes and we're developing in the open so that we have the, pro we have the opportunity to collaborate with all of our stakeholders as we go. So you don't have to wait two years until we're done to see our product. You can start to engage with us today and that's one of the most exciting things. We have a three-week sprint cycle within our Agile process. We'll be having five more of these webinars after this one that we're going to theme towards different pieces of the project as well as unlimited partnerships. So we really want to encourage all of you to reach out to us. We really want to work with you and we're going to be able to work on, on this research together. So one of the other components that we're building that's brand new in this area is called Karma Cloud. Well, what is Karma Cloud? Well, Karma Cloud is the concept that we are going to be using to propose how the infrastructure is going to engage with the Karma platform to enable the infrastructure's capabilities to manage those TISMO strategies. So it's going to be set up in a way where we might draw a geofence over a scenario, let's say a work zone, and we're going to have certain capabilities to send desired speed, uh, desired follow gap, inner platoon gap, maybe limit the platoon size, lane assignment. It's all going to come out of what we do when we develop our TISMA strategies, but the capability of sending information such as regulatory information to vehicles in a specific scenario will enable the state DOTs to manage their freeways more efficiently. So one of the ways we're going to do that, like I said, it's through this open source collaboration vision where we are going to build, collaborate, and deploy a lot of these technologies as we develop them through GitHub and with our partners such as yourselves. And so we really encourage you to, to uh, reach out to us and, and join our Karma group and let's work on this research together. So one of the areas that we're going to be focusing on that's specific to Federal Highway Administration and our partners is these TISMO use cases. What are the future ways this technology can be used to manage the system more efficiently? So we're going to take a three-tiered approach. 
at a high level, we're going to look at the entire TISMO program and try to understand what are some strategies that each of those different areas they would be able to apply cooperative automation. Then we're going to take, take down to the 10,000 foot level and we're going to say, okay, well, let's pick the top four, uh, which is uh, that, we, that we want to start with, which is work zones, traffic incident management, weather, and basic travel. And let's dive a little deeper in there and let's build some scenarios and test them. We're also going to focus on accessibility and understand what are the opportunities that this technology could really help with uh, the accessibility use cases that we would be developing. And then down at the tier three level, down at the ground floor, we're really going to take a, a hard focus on first responders. How are first responders going to engage with this technology on the roadway? And then eventually, how would they use this technology to improve their jobs and improve the safety of what they do for us each and every day? So looking at the four use cases that we will develop in this project focuses on, number one, basic travel, um, and number two, work zones, number three, weather, and number four, traffic incident management. So one of the unique flavors that we are doing in this project, like we did before when we looked at our applications and how each application had a different capability, for example, work zones, this might be a static geofence where we might know where the work zone is and we want to place a work, uh, geofence around it and identify that we only want uh, pairs of platoons to be going through at one second time gap uh, and lane one is closed at this location. So there might be some information that we would pass to the vehicle and the vehicle would receive that information and determine based on where it is how it might achieve those, those new um, rules. But however, weather, weather kind of moves. So can we have a geofence for weather that is dynamic, that follows the storm, that follows the scenario, uh, so that those, as you're driving through a rainstorm, maybe there's a larger gap that you might have and you'll decrease your speed in order to improve safety. And then for traffic incident management, traffic incident management, sometimes incidents occur in, in random places in the highway that maybe aren't monitored by a TMC. So how can the first responder become an infield geofence? to give information for vehicles that are approaching the scene of an incident about what to, what's ahead and how to approach the scene, whether a vehicle, a lane is closed, or if uh, there's a certain speed it shall decrease to to ensure the officer safety and first responder safety. So these are areas that we're going to focus in on the uh, use cases for cooperative automation. Another area that we're working with is we'll be working with SAE. Uh, we have a task order with them through the Joint Program Office to understand and develop a taxonomy for cooperative automated driving systems. We want to focus on developing a white paper looking at the, com the complexities and taxonomy around how we classify a cooperative automated driving system, whether different levels of automation and different levels of connectivity, how that might enable specific features that a vehicle might have and a capability it might have. And then we're also going to try to define the term uh, cooperative automated driving system and provide an update to the J3016 working with that committee. So there is more information that we have on our Federal Highway website and we will try to keep our website up to date and provide as much information as we can, but here's a link at the bottom if you want to learn more about Karma and engage with us further. Um, our GitHub repo is usdot slash fhwa slash stoll, the link is at the bottom, and this is where you can download the Karma platform and start to engage with us from a software development piece. All of our plugins that I mentioned earlier are inside this platform. So if you're, if you're really focusing on speed harmonization with your state partner and you, and you want to get a better understanding of it, all of our mathematics and everything that we've developed in this platform are located in this um, repo. Another good resource is the Confluence page. The Confluence page is our wiki where we have all of our documentation and we're going to keep all of our documentation up to date as we go. Uh, so that would be a great resource to learn more and engage with us further. So with that, I'm going to conclude my first part of the presentation, and I really thank everyone for, for paying attention, and I'm going to pass it right over to John, uh, who's going to take a great dive down into the technical aspect of what is Karma Platform and how can we use it. All right, thank you, Taylor. I hope my voice works all right. Um, so the first slide has got a live walkthrough of the repository itself. I'm not going to go through that right now because I'm afraid it would just be a little bit too much detail right away. But let's talk about some of the technical details about how this software is structured and, and what you can do with it. So uh, everything at the moment is in the one repo called Karma Platform under the uh, section that, that Taylor gave you the link for. Um, 
There are a few things that are considered sensitive that we don't want out in the public. Uh, those are on in a separate repository that we can get you access to if you need it, uh, but they do have some proprietary information. And it's just a few of the uh, device drivers we, we don't want out in the public. Um, in the future during, this is all, what we're just going to be talking about primarily today is for Karma version 2, which is operational right now. That's what we've been doing with all, using for all the tests that Taylor has described. Karma 3 that we're beginning to work on now, uh, we're going to restructure repository a bit. Uh, we're going to be splitting out uh, the Karma platform repo into several different ones. Each driver, for example, will have its own repository and it's going to be uh, Docker-based deployment. So that's coming in the future, but we won't, we won't uh, go over any more of that today. Oops, we don't have a, okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the design philosophy on this uh, software. This is for the vehicle itself, and as a research platform, we're assuming that the vehicle is always operated by a trained safety driver somebody who knows what could happen with the software, why it's doing what it's doing, and so forth, and is prepared to deal with whatever might happen with the vehicle. Uh, I'll just make an aside to say that in all the testing that we've done so far in the last three or four years, we haven't had to really uh, deal with any adverse situations, but... Uh, okay? Okay, sorry, we had a little glitch in the, in the video here. Uh, it's nice to have the, the train safety driver on hand anyway. Uh, the software is built to accommodate uh, faults to the best of its ability. We don't want the test or, or research uh, run that we're doing to just suddenly abort if we can possibly avoid it. The software will do its very best to handle uh, an anomalous situation and keep running even in a degraded mode sometimes. Uh, if in fact it cannot handle a situation it won't go slamming on the brakes, which could cause another accident. It will just simply return control to the human driver and uh, release all controls, so the car will be put into a coast mode. Um, the software is built. Uh, we've gone way out of our way to be vehicle agnostic. We've got a layer of device drivers that will handle all of the hardware interface, but anything above that, it really doesn't matter what kind of car it's on. There are parameters that describe uh, the type of vehicle and, and its characteristics, so the software really doesn't, doesn't have to worry about that at any point. Uh, we do have a guidance API, which is geared towards the research uh, community to hopefully encourage uh, third-party researchers to build a relatively simple uh, plugin that can provide specific algorithms that they want to test for platooning or for lane changing or merging weaving whatever they want to do, drop that in, and then and the platform will be able to do it. I guess we got to click this. Whoops. Quite a sensitive. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going to be taking this on road shows uh, very soon, so we've got to be able to drive anywhere in the U.S. Uh, we don't want to confine ourselves to just a single test track, for example. We want to make the assumption that the car could be going possibly several hundred miles on a, on a single run. So that could involve uh, designs of mapping and, and geolocation and so forth. Automated longitudinal control only. This is SAE level one at the moment. As Taylor pointed out, we're going to be adding level two during the Karma 3 development but for now it's just level one. We do have the ability to put in a, a, a lateral control pseudo driver, if you will. It basically is a way to inform the human driver it's time to change lanes left or right. And so the software actually thinks it's working on a level two vehicle in a way, but it's not. Um, we do not, we, we considered having the software start at boot up of the, of the onboard PC but we decided that doesn't make a lot of sense for the research uh, situations because a lot of times we're going to be driving out to the test track or wherever we're running this thing, and we might be just sitting on the track uh, looking at logs or debugging something for an hour or two at a time, and it's kind of wasteful to have the Karma software actually running and engaged all that time just filling up the logs. So it's up to the human driver to turn it on and off whenever they decide it's necessary. Um, and in the same vein, they can, when, the, when the system is running, 
it can be either the automation can be engaged or disengaged at the driver's discretion. So it may be disengaged at the end of a test run, but the system will still continue to running so that it can be all spun up and ready to go for the next test run. You don't have to spend five minutes restarting it. Uh, this is built on robot operating system, aka ROS. Uh, this is a widely used uh, framework in the robotics community and, and makes it for a lot more uh, reusable, we think. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Okay, so what we've specifically done to support the uh, mobility and, and cooperative behavior for Karma is we've developed some new mobility messages. We are not reusing uh, BSMs. As other researchers have done, we've found that uh, well, we don't really want to uh, screw with the standard that's already been defined, and BSMs tend to be kind of awkward to work with anyway if you're dealing with the Part 2 extensions. So uh, to get the most efficiency out of the bandwidth, we've developed four new uh, dedicated mobility messages just for our, our purposes here. And in fact, the uh, purpose, primary purpose of a BSM is to communicate uh, existing state of the vehicle. These mobility messages are intended to communicate future intentions. That's the thing we need to do when we're talking about cooperation. The messages are structured <clears throat> in the uh, style and flavor of J2735, although they're not in the standard at this point. Um, but they allow us to to pass all the information that we need to do. And uh, let me just review quickly on the right side of the slide. We've got the mobility path message, which simply announces the host vehicle's uh, current intentions for its path in the next several seconds. Uh, this is important for other vehicles to be able to understand where it thinks it's going to be and where, how fast it's going to be getting there and so forth. Uh, then we have two, the work together mobility request and response. The request would be for vehicle A to uh, send a particular intention to vehicle B or to all of its neighbors, say, I would like to work with you on a particular situation, particular cooperative behavior, uh, would you like to um, join me? And then the receiving vehicle or vehicles would send back a response, either an acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement, saying, yes, I, I receive your message, I would like to help you, I'd like to work with you, or I accept the plan that you're submitting or a negative acknowledgement saying, yes, I've received your message, I'm sorry, I can't help you at this time. The fourth one would be a mobility operation, which would be used when we're in a cooperative behavior and we simply need to do this to manage the behavior. So, for example, in a platoon where you would be uh, sending updated status about the platoon to the other members in the platoon. Okay, next page, please. So uh, those are the messages. How are they actually being used? We've got uh, negotiation and swarming. These are kind of two ends of a spectrum of, of types of cooperation we could do. If we're going full negotiation, this is kind of like two lawyers getting together and negotiating a contract where one proposes, hey, let's do, get together and do something, and the other one says, yeah, okay, I like this part, but not that part. Uh, I'm going to send you a counter proposal back and forth. You could get to that extreme. Uh, this is going to be a chatty conversation could use up a lot of bandwidth, but you get an awful lot of richness in the types of things that you could negotiate doing that. Um, but if we need to do something simpler and, and be more conservative on the bandwidth, we could do something more like a swarming thing, uh, simply like what birds, ants, bees tend to do in nature. Uh, everybody just has a few basic uh, instincts or, or motions pre-programmed into their brain, if you will. And, and they tend to work around each other. Uh, we've got some cases where we do that too. Uh, the, each vehicle would state its own intentions and it would receive similar messages from its neighbors and continue to try to work around them, at least knowing what the other's intentions are so that there's not an imminent collision. Uh, this really is not a chatty conversation. The, they tend to be very terse, so they can get done really quickly, but we have some limitations on what can be achieved. So what we would like to do in the future is research some hybrid approaches to that where we can do a little bit of both, get some of the benefits of both, both ends of this uh, spectrum. 
Um, one thing that we're faced with here, our overarching constraint is that there is nobody in charge. We're, our automated vehicle is entering a highway, for example. There might be 20 or 100 other automated vehicles out there. Everybody chatting up a storm, trying to say, uh, I want to do this, you want to do that. There is no authority out there. So these all have to kind of work together and, and learn how to cooperate very quickly. Uh, however, there might be some situations where, where there will be some situations like a cooperative merge where the infrastructure could play a critical role in assigning roles to certain vehicles or telling certain vehicles timing information or lane assignments and things like that. So that, that could be another element uh, that's definitely worth studying some more. So <clears throat> having talked about those two types of cooperation in general, let's go through a couple specific examples. The first one will be with platooning. So we've got uh, car B and A, A is leading, going down the highway. Our goal here is to try and conserve highway space and get uh, as much throughput on the highway as possible by, by closing the gap between these vehicles while still maintaining uh, safety. So in our platoons, we have a leader that is actively managed. This is, this is not a follow the leader type scenario like uh, most CACC experiments have been. This is going to be the leader actively taking part in the platoon, understanding who's behind them, why, what they're doing, and admitting members or telling members they cannot because there might be certain rules limiting the length of the platoons and so forth. Uh, if we have to change lanes, the leader will make that decision as to when and how that's going to happen and so forth. The leader may also limit the, the behavior of the whole platoon to uh, not lose the least capable member, for example, if we have acceleration limits. Uh, followers will join from the back one at a time, and a platoon may split because of control problems or whatever, a cut in, and then uh, a, a new leader would emerge for the back half of that platoon. So walking through a particular platooning example, uh, we'll kind of take this slide left to right here. We've got car A, or sorry, car B following car A at some distance. Both of them, when they get on the highway, they'll be broadcasting a uh, mobility operation message at one hertz saying effectively join my platoon or in other words I'm, a, I'm an automated vehicle out here I'd like to platoon all else being equal I'd prefer to be in a platoon so is there anybody out there that wants to join me they're both broadcasting this uh, B sees the message from A says yeah he's, he's close enough I could probably platoon with him and he's in front of me so it makes sense that I would join his platoon a sees the same kind of message from B, and he says, yeah, he's close enough, but I'm already ahead of him. It doesn't make any sense for me to fall back and join behind B, so I'm going to ignore that. We'll see what B does. At that point, then B will send a mobility request message, which says, may I join you from the rear, vehicle A. Vehicle A receives the message and says, uh, let me check my platoon status. Well, there's nobody else in my platoon. I'm allowed up to five vehicles, for example. Yes, there's room, please join me. So that's the act message that gets sent back. At that point, then B receives that, says, okay, here I go. I'm gonna accelerate a little bit. I'm going to join A once I get close enough that I'm considered within joining distance. Uh, B will then send a, another mobility request message saying, may I complete the joining process? I think I'm in position. Uh, a then looks it over, says, yeah, I believe you're in position. There's a mobility response message sent back acknowledging. Okay, we're now in a platoon. At that point, B is now a member of this platoon, no longer an independent vehicle, so he's not going to broadcast any more of these uh, operation messages saying join my platoon. He's already in a platoon. However, A will continue to do that if there's an empty space in his platoon. If he's allowed five cars, he's only got two, we can continue to advertise for more vehicles to join. Uh, in, in parallel to that, A will also be broadcasting an operation message to manage the platoon. This might tell B and other followers things like, here's our current speed, here's the speed that we need to change to, uh, we need to change lanes, we're going to be slowing down up ahead, or whatever. So that's how we manage the platoon. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, another case, which, which is a lot more simplistic, would be the lane merging. Uh, this is going to try and smooth traffic when we get to a bottleneck where maybe a lane is disappearing, for example, a merge ramp is coming onto a highway maybe. Uh, the situation is driven by the relative urgency. Who needs to be in this left lane in the example at the left? Who needs to be there more would be the question. Um, 
Vehicle A coming in and wants to merge, he would initiate with uh, sending a mobility request message. It contains his intended path, which would be the yellow dashed line on the figure, and says, please, uh, B, let me in. I would like to get over here. You know, my lane's going away, for example. B would look at that and, and first would say, sure, I'd like to help you out. Is it physically possible for me to do so? If I can safely decelerate and leave a gap for you to move over according to your planned path, then I will do so and I'll send you back a mobility acknowledgement. If I can't do that, then I'm going to send back a NAC saying, I'm sorry, wave off, I can't, I can't do this safely. And then it's going to be up to vehicle A to come up with another plan, whatever that may be. But that's the end of the scenario. So that's kind of more on the swarming side of the spectrum. So let's talk a little bit about the, the structure of the software. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail here, but I just wanted to give you an overview. And you can see some of these details. Well, you can see an awful lot of these details on the website. We'll get to that in a minute. So we have uh, the, the Karma software is the big pink blob in the middle of that diagram, this, this uh, deployment diagram. Uh, the Karma platform itself really provides kind of a middleware, if you will, to abstract the vehicle hardware away, um, provide basic automation functions and communication functions. On top of that, we have the green box, which represents the uh, independent um, guidance plugins that anybody could author and just drop in. They don't require a rebuild of the software or anything. It really is a plugin. You can just connect it and, and the Karma system will find it and run it when it's appropriate. Uh, these currently need to be written in Java. The, the Karma platform is primarily Java. We are on a gradual path to migrate to more C++. Um, so there may be an API for C++ plugins soon. But at the moment, there is not. Uh, on the side, we also have an operator tablet that sits on the dashboard of the vehicle that is the human driver's ability to interact with the Karma system, see status of, of what the system is doing and what the vehicle is doing, and also give it commands. Okay, next. All right, we've got a nice uh, detailed eye chart on the left there, which is our top-level package diagram of the, of the Karma platform software. Um, we just kind of want to brush over some highlights of this thing. We are built on ROS uh, Kinetic version, and we use ROS Java, of course, because we're writing in Java. This is built on Ubuntu 16, um, and we have a layered architecture here. From the bottom up, we've got a driver layer, we've got a guidance and user, user um, I'm sorry, environment layer, and then guidance and user interface at the top. So let's just uh, take a quick poke at each of those layers. On the bottom, we have the drivers. And this includes the node at the top, uh, which I'll just kind of walk through real quick. We've got controller drivers, five categories. Controller drivers, these send the commands to the vehicle, how to actuate the vehicle's input devices, throttle and brake at this point. Communications drivers, DSRC, cellular, and so forth. Uh, position drivers, we want to find out where we are by reading GPS, IMU. Uh, sensor drivers, right at the current time, our vehicles only have radars, forward-looking radars on them, but this will be expanded soon to include LIDARs, side-looking radars, uh, video cameras, and so forth. Uh, and then we have CAN bus drivers, so we can talk to the vehicle's uh, computer, onboard computers through, through CAN messages. Uh, each driver is a separate ROS node, and they all are managed by this thing at the top called the Interface Manager. It uh, does dynamic driver discovery, so we could have CAN drivers in there for uh, a vehicle A, uh, a Cadillac. We could have CAN drivers in there for a Ford. We could have CAN drivers in there for something else. And whatever vehicle we're installed in, that driver will be able to detect is that hardware available and, and communicating properly. And it will report back to the interface manager, yes, I'm alive. I'm here. You can use it. OK, next slide. Uh, the next layer is the environment layer. So this covers, uh, these are mostly ROS nodes in, in themselves as well. We've got a message node, which provides the communication through DSRC. It packages and unpackages J2735 messages for the comms driver to send out or what it's received. Uh, we've got a sensor fusion in here that tells us something about our environment. Uh, geometry also helps with that, it gives all the math for the, for the uh, 3D uh, location on the Earth. Roadway and route describe what's going on around us in terms of the, that the vehicle's guidance software can handle. 
and uh, what our route is going to be so we know where we're going and how to get there. Okay, at the top, the next slide, uh, the top left of that diagram is the guidance package. This has got a whole bunch of packages inside it, but this one big guidance package is all one ROS node at this time. Uh, it includes a conflict detector so that we can start to find out if we're going, if we think we're going to have a uh, collision, potential collision with another vehicle. Uh, we can do something to avoid that and alter our plans. Uh, mobility router just routes these mobility messages coming in from other vehicles and tells it which guidance component to handle it. And then we have a couple of things that manage the plugins. So we have third-party plugins sitting on top of this. And, and this will decide which one is active at, at a given time. Arbitrator, in particular, has the brains to decide how to plan our, our forward trajectory, and uh, which would cover maybe the next several hundred meters of travel, and which guidance plugin is going to do that at which time. Uh, and the trajectory is simply a collection of simple maneuvers, elementary maneuvers like speed up and slow down, change lanes left, change lanes right. So there's a question in the chat box saying on slide 16 it states that the messages are using J2735 messages. But earlier it was stated that only four new messages are not defined in J2735 are used. Is there anything that we can clear up for that? So we, the four new mobility messages are written in the style of J2735. They're UPER encoded. They are not in the standard at this time, but we hope to get them in there uh, eventually. With a little bit more testing, we'll, we'll uh, settle on a, a hopefully a static uh, structure for those. I hope that answers. OK, I want to keep moving. <clears throat> OK, uh, the code base, we've got the, uh, if you go to the GitHub uh, repository, Karma platform, you can see all this detail in there. Uh, we've got a readme that, that gives you all kinds of links to architecture documentation that goes a lot further than what I've just presented here. Uh, we've got detailed designs for each one of those uh, components, uh, several pages of detailed gory designs for all that. Um, contributing instructions, if you want to make a contribution, please jump in and feel free to do so today. We'd love to have your inputs and thoughts. Uh, there's instructions on how to do that. We've got an administrator guide if you want to build and install and try to run this thing, you can do that. But we've got a user guide for people once, once you get it running, how it actually works, how to interact with the user interface. Uh, and then, of course, there's the obligatory license uh, information there as well. So uh, we've got some, some plugins at this point built in, but uh, we invite other third-party plugin authors to, uh, you could put one in your own repository and we could find a way to link to it pretty easily. Uh, so we've got a GitHub site and a Confluence site. I believe Taylor already uh, pointed out those uh, links, but uh, feel free to go check those out. We'd love to have your inputs on there. Okay, so now I want to turn it over to somebody who unfortunately didn't get uh, written credit on these slides, but uh, my co-engineer Kyle Rush is going to present a little bit of a hands-on on, on walking through uh, build and running uh, Karma. Hi, everybody. Um, so what I'd like to do at this point is uh, to get even more uh, concrete, I guess, and walk through uh, kind of a standard vertical slice of what uh, pulling down the Karma platform and building it and a little bit of what it looks like while running uh, looks like. Um, so hopefully this video uh, works out. Um, a quick clarification, we do have documentation for all of this on our GitHub repository and Confluence site. So if you're looking to uh, kind of follow along at a later date and time, maybe looking at this on the video, uh, please refer to that as some of this stuff is kind of dynamic as development processes and tools uh, change and update with time. Um, so. Uh, let me get this video going. Uh, all right, uh, so we're starting off with uh, Ubuntu 16.04, as mentioned, uh, and I'm using Visual Studio Code here, but this supports any standard editor. Uh, so I'm going to start off by uh, pulling down or uh, setting up the uh, ROS workspace for our project. Uh, so I've got a folder in my home directory named Karma Webinar, and I'm just uh, going through and setting up the Catkin workspace and pulling down the Karma uh, repository from GitHub. Uh, so that'll take a little bit of time, just as uh, it downloads. But uh, this will get us all the code we need uh, to run kind of a basic distribution of the, uh, the Karma software. So uh, once we have all this code downloaded, we'll be able to start the build process 
Uh, and from the, uh, the build, we can kind of walk through and show you some of uh, what Karma looks like while it's running, the user interface, and how things are, are going. So it's just going to show that we got all the code downloaded, and now I can see it uh, in my editor. And now to uh, start the build process, it's going to go back up to the root of our Catkin workspace and just use the standard Catkin build command. Um, now this build process can take uh, a somewhat lengthy period of time, uh, depending on your computer's processing power. Uh, so we've kind of cut out a good chunk of the middle of this just for speed. Uh, there we go. As you can see, it jumped to 96% uh, just for expediency's sake. Um, but once this build finishes up, uh, there's a couple more steps we have to go through uh, because we're running it locally. Uh, rather than on our vehicles, uh, we have to edit some configuration data that will load into the web user interface. Um, as normally we deploy to a, a different PC than we're loading the web content from. So we're going to uh, hop into that in just a second. So there's a file, karma config.js, uh, that contains the configured IP address, as you can see it there in this uh, scripts folder. Um, it contains the configured IP address of the host machine that will be running the, uh, the Karma software. And for running it locally, we just have to make sure to change that to localhost instead of our default uh, in-vehicle address. Uh, now that we have that one edit made, uh, we can copy these uh, web files, all of our HTML, uh, our scripts and whatnot that we use to run the web UI into our uh, local web folder. And then just make sure that we uh, patch up the permissions so that they can uh, be served correctly. Uh, but once we have that done, uh, we're kind of good to go and ready to start actually starting the Karma platform itself. So we uh, run the Karma platform via the uh, standard ROS launch command. So we'll have to source uh, our uh, setup scripts under the uh, devil folder or uh, the install folder if you choose to install it. Uh, in your Catkin workspace. Um, and if you run a, a tab complete after typing ROS Launch Karma, we get our, uh, several different launch files you can start with, but the uh, Saxton CAV source dot launch file is the primary one for running kind of on a, a local environment. So now that we've launched that, uh, we're getting all the startup output from all of our ROS nodes that are being spun up at the moment. Um, all of this is being saved to a log file, which we'll go back and look at a little bit later exactly what the format of this is and where you can find them. Um, but we can just see kind of the basic uh, output that's going on here as the system is booting up. So now uh, we'll open up our web browser and point it back to that local host address uh, that we configured earlier. And this is kind of our, our start page. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple options we have here to record a raw SPAC data or run a remote launch. But since we're running this locally already, we don't need to, to worry about those at the moment. So we'll just click OK and it'll start uh, connecting the web UI directly into our, our running Karma software. And this is our main page. You can see a couple things that uh, look like they're not rendering exactly as we would expect them to. Uh, the user interface here is optimized for the tablet uh, in the vehicle. Uh, so all this appears fairly normal on that device, but when running it locally, sometimes the web browsers uh, don't exactly have the same interpretation. Um, but as you can see here, we've got uh, our main page where we're looking at the list of routes that the software would like us to select from. Uh, we're going to be determining which route we would like the vehicle to drive. Um, there's really only one route that works with these simulated uh, data sets we're using, which is going to be the TFHRC circle. Uh, as the mock GPS data we're feeding into it right now to run it locally, uh, as we don't have access to the real hardware, uh, is kind of programmed to output data adjacent to this, uh, this particular route file. Now that we've selected our route and it seems to have validated that we're in the right area, uh, it presents us with a list of plugins to select. Uh, we can turn any of these on and off. You see a couple that are already blue that have a star next to them because they're required. They can't be turned off. They're basic functionality. Um, but we'll turn on the platooning plugin, uh, and now we can configure the, uh, the different views we'll have in our main page, showing different uh, widgets that will be rendered as we're, uh, we're kind of running the software. And then finally, once we activate it, it takes it to the main page. Again, there's some uh, rendering discrepancies here between our tablet and the, uh, the browser on the local PC here. Um, but uh, you get the kind of general idea. We can also take a look at the map view, uh, and you can see our current location as reported by our mock GPS drivers, uh, and all the data output we can get from it, kind of live as it's running. This is a, a subset of the data that's being captured on the PC and in the vehicle as it's running. 
If you look on the, uh, the second column from the left as well, there are several status indicators um, indicating the status of our controller at the top, our localization solution just below that, and uh, our communications below that, as well as uh, cooperative indicators and what maneuvers we're currently controlling the vehicle with. But in this case, as it's just a simulated version, we don't necessarily uh, have that running at the moment. So now we'll go a little bit into uh, what the uh, logs themselves look like. Now that, let's say we've uh, just finished our session. Uh, we're going to close the Carmel platform. Uh, normally we can close it from the UI, or if you're running it locally, you can close it by using a control C from whatever command line you started it with. Uh, then we're going to go to uh, slash opt slash karma, which is kind of our de facto uh, directory for all things karma. Uh, and we have a logs folder right under there where we have uh, different folders time stamped um, for uh, each particular run of the vehicle depending on when it was started. So in this case, uh, 2018-1130 is when this uh, was captured, and then the last half of that is the, uh, the hour mark in timestamp. So we've got a bunch of different uh, files here, um, one for each uh, significant component in the system. As you can see, we've got guidance.txt, which will contain all the data output from guidance, interface manager, lateral control driver message, and then our, our mock drivers, uh, which are just going to be outputting the, the mock data we've input. Uh, on a real system, you'd see uh, things like the, uh, the uh, radar drivers or whatever physical implementations you're using in that case uh, output into this folder as well. Uh, and these log files are all in text format, um, so we can look at them with standard Unix tools like less, um, and uh, that's one of the common ways. We'll, we'll actually parse through a lot of these logs is if we'll know in particular what we're looking for. Um, in addition, uh, they're structured in a way that makes them pretty easy to query with tools like that. Uh, we have a timestamp in the leftmost column uh, separated by vertical bars. Then we have uh, the severity of the log, uh, in this case info, but we have things like warning, uh, severe, fatal, etc. cetera. Um, the next vertical bar over, we have the particular component that's responsible for that log. You can see light bar manager, uh, guidance state handler, maneuver inputs. Uh, this lets us know what the origin of that particular log line is so we can filter on that as well. And then we have kind of a free form field right after that that's just, uh, we call it a tag field. Um, but it's a way to kind of capture cross-cutting um, functionalities. In this case, you'll see startup there so that any uh, log lines that are associated with system startup um, might have that startup tag. Uh, and then if you wanted to get all of the startup data, uh, you could simply search for that field. And then finally, we have the actual text of the, uh, the log line itself uh, all the way on the right. I'm just scrolling here to show some more of the, uh, the log contents. You'll see the, the plugin manager now has the tag plugin, for example. Um, and we often commonly use grep, again, to uh, search through these uh, log files. So if I want to get all the plugin related data, I could simply grep for plugin and guidance. And that would show me all of the lines associated with the tag plugin. Um, that way I can know what plugins were started up in a given run, or if any of the plugin initializations had errors or whatnot. Um, and I can look for things from the plugin manager, for example. Similar concept. Um, so they're pretty easy to, to handle. Uh, just because they're text data, you can use very standard methods of, of processing them. So I think that concludes my, my walkthrough of the Karma build and run process. Um, we're going to move over to questions in just a second, I believe, but I'll, I'll hand this off. Um, but uh, thank you. Yes, so we have been getting some questions in the questions and discussion pod. Um, if you have any other questions, definitely put that in here now. Um, John, John, Taylor, and um, Kyle can answer those for you as well. And we also have the useful links, too. So if you guys want to look at some of the resources that we were talking about today, you can click through those now. I believe Clay and Cave put in a question, and Sue Dakar in the chat actually responded with a link to the Karma Wiki page where you can look at some of the um, architecture, architecture and design documents as well. Someone just asked, Patrick, is the Karma 3 completely independent and does not tie in with any particular vehicle make model? 
and hardware? Okay, this is John, I'll answer that. Uh, it's, yes, outside of the driver layer, it's independent and it should be able to handle whatever type of vehicle you put it on. Of course, uh, you're gonna have to provide vehicle characteristic information, so it's gonna have to know some things about acceleration limits, maybe braking systems, so forth. But uh, the software is really vehicle agnostic, yes. Mohammed also just asked, what, what does Karma offer in terms of performance measurements and an evaluation for CADS? So, uh, uh, Mohammed, this is Taylor. Um, what Karma is going to enable us to do is start to focus in on those TISMO use cases. So as we develop the TISMO use cases in a current task that's on, that is ongoing right now, when that is developed, it will have a list of all of our performance measures and requirements and how we're going to measure, um, you know, the impact of cooperative automated driving systems in those use cases. So at this moment in time, we're in the process of identifying and determining what those performance metrics will be. Um, and you're more than welcome to engage with us on that moving forward. Just uh, reach out to me and I can get you in touch with uh, uh, our, our parties here focusing on that effort. And then we do have the link for our Karma webpage, our wiki, um, as well as the GitHub page, but if one of you would be able to address where they can find more information on the simulation environment, and will it be based on using vehicle dynamics, visual, visualization, et cetera? Can they just go to the links and find that? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a question by RADU, by Radu. Um. Oh, about the simulation? No. That's the doctor. Yeah, so we're, we don't have a, much of a simulation environment at this point. We've got the mock drivers, and, and as Kyle showed, you can, you can run a little bit of a simulation there uh, for a particular route. You could feel free to enhance those, but uh, we're going to be working in the coming year on building a much more robust simulation environment. Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of, I guess, improvements moving forward uh, from Karma 2 uh, as we're starting to look at the architecture uh, and our discussions with the AutoWare team uh, moving forward to enhance the system and improve the system with these new functionalities that the ADS platform is going to provide. So currently, just to reiterate, Karma 2 is a level one, it, it operates on a level one equipped vehicle. So it controls brake and throttle, and humans always steer in the vehicles that, in the testing we've been doing to date. Uh, however, so moving forward, what Karma 3 is going to provide is that ADS capability. Uh, Karma 3 is envisioned that we are technology agnostic, that we are vehicle agnostic. However, it requires the, the integration with some sort of a black box, black box functionality that integrates and gives you control of specific features in the vehicle, such as brake, acceleration, throttle, steering, and so forth. So as long as you have that capability and that functionality to integrate with those, those, uh, those systems, those subsystems, uh, Karma will, and AutoWare, uh, will enable the capabilities of the ADS. Um, sounds good. Cool. So, yeah. well, again, if you have any questions about anything that we discussed even earlier during the webinar, definitely feel free to put those into the uh, question or discussion pod and we can answer those for you. We're ready. Well, we okay. appreciate everyone's uh, attendance today. We do have a question coming in oh, from a couple people, I believe, so okay. we'll just give them a few minutes to type out. <clears throat> So Gretchen wants to know, what part of the spectrum does Karma operate in and does it use DSRC? That's a great question. Um, today, since we've been doing this research since 20, uh, you know, 2013 when we built our first um, uh, uh, level one enabled equipped vehicles, we've been using DSRC 
Um, and we will continue to use DSRC as it is the only available uh, technology that, that is available to consumers uh, to operate with. However, we are open to new, newer types of technology and we, look, and we will be uh, you know, trying to look at if as, as new technologies uh, enter into the marketplace, uh, how we can start to evaluate and use those capabilities to enhance the applications. Hey, Taylor, don't forget we did use, do one experiment with the 4G connectivity. We did, yes, and we, we, yeah, we did use 4G cellular um, as well uh, outside the DSRC spectrum. We just got a question from Suzanne Sloan from the US DOT. She wants to know where does the work with SAE on cooperative automated definition stand? Suzanne, that is a great question. I'm working with Keith Williams um, on that task right now. We are in the process of engaging uh, some of the new task uh, and committees uh, within SAE as there's been a reorganization. Uh, we are going to be approaching them and working with those groups and uh, committees on uh, these efforts moving forward. But that's a great question, and I think that's a good, this is getting around a good opportunity and a good time for folks to get engaged, uh, especially the folks that are at the SAE community. So there's a question from Oscar about, um, why are we planning to port Java code to C++? That's what you guys. Well, I think uh, there's a wider part of the robotics community that is naturally drawn to C++. There's a lot more reusable software components out there in C++, and we feel that that's where most of the uh, people that, that might be potential partners with us uh, are more familiar with. Nothing, not that anything's wrong with Java, but I think that would just open up a wider audience. And next question we have from Ahmed is, is can, uh, can driver able to read all vehicle can schematics for all vehicle makes and models? Right. You might have I addressed that earlier. Ed Leslie put an answer to that just a couple lines down. Basically, we need to write a CAN driver for each specific device, uh, vehicle because they all have different uh, ways they use CAN codes, so there is no universal uh, method and the fact they try, they try hard to not make them all the same. John, can you clarify the uh, trajectory uh, for three seconds in the future um, and how that's uh, changeable? So the trajectory is, is an object in the um, guidance software that represents uh, where we're going to be going. Um, it's a collection of maneuver objects. Like I said, it's the speed up, slow down maneuvers, whatever each maneuver will last several seconds cover several meters, uh, and then they're all chained together uh, head to tail. Um, so that, that creates a trajectory in the software space. Now, if we're talking about the broadcast of our, of our path down track to other vehicles, um, that's not exactly a trajectory. It's just a, a set of latitude, longitude points. Each point says, um, Here's where I'm going to be. It's got a timestamp on it, and it's got a speed with it. So at any point, say it's good, at, it's configurable, but right now we have it to broadcast 60 data points into the future at uh, 0 0.1 second spacing, 100 millisecond spacing. So it covers six seconds of future travel. And each point says latitude, longitude, time, speed. Does that, I hope that answers the question. I think I can. Go ahead. So I'll, I'll tag in for uh, a bit here as well, just to add on. Um, but at, at present, we use the, uh, the 0.1 second frequency of sampling uh, future points. Uh, and we can run into performance issues with processing those messages if they contain long sequences of points or even space limitations in the over-the-air bandwidth. Uh, so one of the things we're looking at uh, under Karma 3 is if there are alternatives to a point-based message system where maybe we could represent trajectories in a continuous fashion that could uh, save us processing time or uh, uh, be more compact over the air. Uh, so there's certainly uh, interest in, in looking at how we can change the length of these uh, over-the-air mobility path and mobility request messages that use these uh, data points. So as far as the changing of, of those points, though, um, I, we didn't address that at all, really. So it broadcasts, this is my intended path for the next six seconds, and that's my intent at this moment. At any point, of course, that might change because the situation is constantly evolving. So 
if that doesn't change and I continue to follow that path, I'll rebroadcast every three seconds so that you always know in advance where I'm going to be. We're never going to run clear to the end of it. Uh, but if for some reason I have to update, make an emergency change of plans, then I'll immediately rebroadcast the new six seconds worth so that you won't ever see me traveling on a path that's not what I've broadcast. And we have another question also coming in. Uh, will OEMs be willing to use an open source environment to support mobility applications? Yeah, and that's a good question. And, you know, kind of the vision for, for Karma is Karma is a tool for us to understand the opportunities that this technology can provide uh, and enable more efficient uh, movement of, you know, smarter ADS technology that's, that's on its way into our, into our road network. So we're not saying that Karma is something that everyone has to adopt. It's a tool for us to understand what the opportunities are and for um, researchers, folks in the uh, industry as well as in the public sector to use the capabilities to help address some of the things that they might be looking at and to find opportunities in, in ways that they can use this system to help with the uh, safety and efficient movement of traffic. We also have a question from Azim. If we move on to higher levels of automation, level three plus, ROS may not work with real-time processing, um, in, including intense video processing. Are you able? To, are you open to a, other alternatives? For example, QNX for automotive. So yes, the answer is yes. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, we are starting to consider moving into uh, uh, porting to ROS two, which would support QNX and other uh, real-time systems. give just a couple more minutes to those that may have some questions for the question and discussion pod. And you guys can also take this time to download the slides you'll see on the in the middle towards the bottom. You'll be able to download the slides from today's presentation. Um, the actual webinar will be available through the NOCO website as well in the next coming days. So if you would like to listen to the audio that goes along with the webinar, you can do that as well. I believe someone asked about sharing this with students um, in their classroom or with any colleagues. You can definitely go ahead and do that. All right, um, so thanks everyone for attending today's webinar and uh, we had really great information shared with us today. I hope you found it helpful. Um, and uh, that is all. I, on behalf of the National Operations Center of Excellence, I want to wish you a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.